Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Godzilla podcast. Well, I thought I would share something very, very fascinating within the Godzilla world. If you have a couple of hours of free time today, be sure to check this out. Basically, what it is, and a big thanks to um, one of my users there on my Facebook channel, the Cryptids and Monsters slash Godzilla Movie News channel, which by the way, if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, be sure to do so. I post a lot lot of interesting things there stuff that I normally can't post say on YouTube including a lot of pictures of the Godzilla world itself so if you have a chance go there subscribe and then that way you'll be able to see on a daily basis some of my stuff that I find very interesting and I even post I guess you could call it some more personal stuff there too just a little glimpse essentially into what I like and what I don't like so check it out but this user he pointed me to the right direction to this other website um, I had posted something the other day where I was talking about the only known photograph of the Griffin from the a cancelled Godzilla 1994 film well, it turns out that on SciFiJapan.com, uh, they have made an exhaustive, and I mean it is beautifully detailed history of the entire debacle. It's it's called Godzilla Unmade, the history of John DeBont's unproduced TriStar film. And they had it made into four separate parts. That's what I'm telling you, if you have a few hours... Be sure to check it out. It is well worth it. I mean, this stuff reads almost like a novel because it re pretty much details every single step that led before John DeBot came on board. In other words, like uh, some of the history beforehand, maybe some of the failed attempts. And then it went into the actual John DeBont film or the attempted film itself. And it goes really personal. I mean, it describes some of the most personal details associated with its success and then its ultimate failure like whatever caused it to fail and then finally it delves into the world after that which of course involves the Dean Devlin Roland Emmerich 98 Godzilla film and how that came to be within the actual franchise very fascinating stuff I mean the, the, after I was reading all of this this practically begs to have uh, let's say a documentary made you know how the recent um, Superman I think it was called um, the death and return of Superman film that was never made well that one um, Superman lives if I, I think I recall is what it was gonna be now it has a documentary that's about to debut some fan that is of Superman lore decided that he wanted to delve into that world and share with everyone what happened like why it caused it to uh, basically start and then be cancelled and so this particular series in sci-fi Japan goes through the very very same thing it is so so awesome so check out the links I've included all four links below on my part and then when you're there um, be sure to look at the information particularly parts three and part four because those are the ones that delve into the very rich detailed history you want to hear about why the John DeBont film went unproduced and then subsequently the Dean Devlin Roland Emmerich film went on to be made it is by far fantastic there are dozens and dozens of pictures that were given um, a lot of those internal pictures even I don't know um, of, of how they could be shared I don't know who had them but they went ahead and they shared them with this site and then that way you'll get to see a very detailed look I mean some of the stuff stands out beautifully um, to give you an example um, uh, of, of what basically was the catalyst of the failure of the John DeBont film it had to do with the micromanaging of the budget uh, John DeBont wanted of so-and-so budget the studio was really hesitant on that budget and that this actually came because at that time and this is why it's kind of tragic because Godzilla's hands were metaphorically chained like he didn't have any uh, let's say chance at all with his film being made what had happened was the studio at that time was losing a lot of money they went through a restructuring of sorts uh, some of their chiefs in fact were blowing through money left and right um, purposely it seemed uh, like they were blowing through money just to 
expense it and that's it and so what had happened was when those chiefs and those producers got fired um, then or they left in other words then they left also with contractual obligations which cost the studio even more money and so that's when uh, they decided you know what let's go ahead and our next feature which coincidentally and tragically happened to be the big budget Godzilla that's when they started to realize oh my goodness we're gonna have to tweak this down because we just lost a lot of money and something is gonna have to change and unfortunately that was the Godzilla film itself and then it shows details into what John DeBont's mindset was it's fascinating because he's a lot like um, today's present day Guillermo de Toro where he was being told the budget has to be so and so he kind of compromised in some ways but he was still very adamant about not changing other things which goes into the mindset of how some people some studio heads conflict with the filmmakers themselves and how when there's no compromise like let's say uh, it's that saying when an uh, unstoppable force meets an immovable object what happens there's a standstill that's what happened with the Godzilla film and it'll even detail the exact moment when this when the thing was canceled and then what had happened with some of the people that were involved and how they reacted to it and then finally um, there's a really great portion when Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich came on board basically they came on board because they had promised that they would stick to a clear budget and a small budget uh, they were well known for making good blockbuster films but being very budget conscious which according to the article was um, uh, Toho's, I'm sorry was uh, TriStar's dream come true like this is exactly what they wanted this is exactly what they needed and so when they came on board, they came with the caveat that we can do this, but we want to do this our way. And you'll see some of the reasons why they completely discarded the Godzilla design, like the ones that you and I know that we all love. And they went with their Americanized Godzilla, leaner, sleeker, more modernized, um, especially like a huge change. And then one of my favorite parts was it shows the rich detail in the history that occurred when they first visited Toho Studios to actually unveil the McKay because what they did was even though they were hired on board they still had to get a ultimate approval from Toho Studios and if they did not get an approval even though they were hired as director and producer then they would not move forward interestingly enough they still got paid a certain upfront fee of some sort but part of the rest of their fee depended on getting approval so they went into it headstrong and I'll read you this part um, because to give you an idea they went into it thinking we're not just gonna change and tweak little things here and there we're gonna make it our way and we're gonna change it so that way it truly is the American blockbuster it deserves to be so here's what happened they made a McKay which is uh, probably about two feet tall and it's the American Godzilla the Gino if you will and it's the design they went straight to Toho Studios in Tokyo they took it they had it in like a I guess you could call it like a secret box of some sort or something covering it they had all the Toho executives around them uh, apparently uh, Devlin the producer couldn't make it because he was sick at the time but the guy that created the American Gino the way it looked his last name was Tatopoulos he was there with the director Emmerich and then this is the direct quote he, uh, because Emmerich tried to warm them up and tried to introduce him and say here's what we're gonna do here's what we plan on doing here's why we plan on doing it and then it would finish his presentation with the unveiling of the design and this is what it says with Emmerich's introduction out of the way Tatopoulos unveiled his Godzilla artwork and McKay it was met with a gasp from the Toho execs followed by stone silence and this is what Tatopoulos said he said after designing my last Godzilla the one that wound up in the movie I felt very secure and I believe we had something great but the day I sat in front of the Japanese I thought what have I done am I crazy they're not gonna go for it and then Emmerich responded he said they were speechless they stared at it and there was silence for a couple of minutes and then they said to them in other words they said could you come back tomorrow and then he, uh, that's when Emmerich thought for sure that we he did not have a movie then thereafter but it's very fascinating stuff you'll get to hear the reactions after that too and how Toho Studios basically gave their blessing 
And then, of course, all the things afterward with Toho later on uh, abandoning the idea and blaming them. It's quite fascinating. As I said earlier, there is a documentary that is begging, absolutely begging to be made of all this information. Uh, will it ever be made? Um, maybe. There could be a Kickstarter. There could be one of those uh, campaigns uh, started where... People can donate, and then there'll be a documentary. There'll probably be some Godzilla fan who's a very talented filmmaker that could use this information and start it. But I don't think it'll happen because once you read all those four pieces, you'll see there's a lot of personal information. There's a lot of emotion tied to it. A lot of people were hurt with regards to the John DeMont project and how they were scrapped and pushed to the sides and then replaced by um, Emmerich and then uh, Dean Devlin. And then also there's still resentment to this day. And then on top of that, you would have to get approval from Toho Studios, who is of course notorious absolutely notorious for not for not showcasing anything that could harm themselves or anything that could harm their franchise and their trademarks and their copyrights and basically that's what this would be because a big portion of it would be dedicated to them saying yes to the designs and to the American Godzilla and that's not going to happen so anyways check out the links when you have a chance and again check out my Facebook site and be sure to uh, like it you'll you'll get all the updates that I do on a daily basis with uh, the Godzilla world so alright everybody thanks again as always take care